A very good afternoon to all of you and welcome to an exceptionally exciting start to our Sunset Safari live from the Maasai Mara in Kenya with probably one of the most famous male lion coalitions of all time, the Musketeers. Not to be confused with the che Cheetah Musketeers who are also one of the most famous coalitions of all time. My name is Jamie and this afternoon Manu is on camera with me. The weather is rolling in at a rate of knots out here in the Mara. Brent is already caught in the storm. The, w the rain is blowing across in our direction. We're actually probably going to have to move pretty soon. But I just had to show you all four male lions in their absolute glory. The first time I've ever seen all four of them together and what a spectacular sight it is and now we're going to sit and watch them in the rain because this is a live safari for those of you that are new first of all you picked a good afternoon to start watching second of all you can ask questions and feed through comments on hashtag safari live on twitter Manu <laughs> I'm trying to oh, oh by the way there's one thing I do want to show you quickly when he's up one of them does have a very nasty injury and just to let you know the rangers are aware of it you can see it's been stitched up in the past and he's pulled the stitches he's burst the stitches so he does have a very nasty gash on his leg oh poor boy oh flop I know can't be that much fun walking on that oh scars up this is so wonderful this really is they're all limping all four of them Scar, flop. You and that mane, you belong in some kind of shampoo commercial. You really do. Or possibly styling moose. Now he's hiding his face look, he's embarrassed. <laughs> Foot up in the air in submission. How utterly, what a fantastic, what a fantastic start to our afternoon. Manu and I have had the most wonderful day. Just as the sunrise safari ended, we found a female leopard near the salt lick. We followed her for a little while. Unfortunately, she took us down into a no signal area. So although we tried to stay with her, she went to sleep in the most uncomfortable looking tree in the most awkward spot for us. And then I got a report that Scar was here under one of the gardenias. I did not expect to find all four of them and I'm so, so excited for the afternoon ahead. They're all four of them looking pretty hungry. They're looking a little battle worn. Although that doesn't stop them from picking a fight with the odd fly, does it, mister? And as I said, the first time I've ever seen all four of them together. I've seen three of them together, but this is a first for me. I mean, you want to know how Scar got his impressive Scar. Now, it's something that we need Mr. Scar to look up for, I think, this particular explanation, although he seems to be relatively reluctant. Manu, I think the rain just blew past us. I think we just were saved. I think we got so lucky. Um, so Scar got his Scar in a massive fight with another male. I'm not sure which males. I know in the past that the Musketeer Male Lion Coalition have come into come to blows with Blackie and Lipstick, the four kilometer boys on the other side of the river. And as far as I know, the four kilometer boys took over a part of their territory towards the ridge. Now, I'm not sure about whether or not Scar obtained his Scar during that battle. I don't think so. But I can tell you that it was a fearsome looking wound when he first acquired it. You can just imagine raw, red, painful looking. It was treated by a vet. It is one of the things that makes Kenya slightly different to South Africa in that natural injuries in the Maasai Mara are treated by vets. Look at this poser. Mane blowing in the wind. Little bit of a limp, but he'll be okay. So, the only thing really that I could say more impressive than the males, four male lions' manes would be that of Brent Leo Smith after three days across the river without a hairbrush. Yes, I did forget my hairbrush. Or did I do it on purpose? Uh, good afternoon, my name is Brent Leo Smith and I have Jahawi on camera. 
and we are on top of Rhino Ridge in search of the two female cheetah and uh, if we find the two female cheetah it'll actually be a record day for me is, um, so far today we have seen eight different cheetah we've seen the five musketeers the unknown female um, Miale and her young male and uh, we are however having to head towards home so we decided to come through the ridge area to see if we could possibly maybe add some cheetah to that tally Malaika was around double crossing yesterday fortunately that's an area that's beset with gremlins for us so we decided to come look for the two girls we're up on the ridge somewhere now uh, Jahami and I got a little bit wet a little bit earlier but as you can see the sun is out now but I'm wondering is Jamie not going to get a little bit wet uh, sooner than I am and I you can see in ahead of us I think, uh, let's just work out, okay, no, Jamie's okay. So Jamie's to the left of the euphorbia, or that tree there. Jamie's about there. So that rain is between us and final control, actually. So that final control is behind that big storm somewhere. Rex is wondering what do I like most about being across the river? The cheetah, Rex the cheetah. So we do, as I said, I've already seen eight different cheetah today. Um, and we we're only looking for five. <laughs> but yes, no, um, I think it's definitely the cheetah. Now, if you want to ask any questions like Rex just did, hashtag Safari Live uh, on whatever platform you're watching on will be the best way to get a hold of us. Now, as you can see, there's not much shade up on the ridge. So we're going to check the shady spots to see if that's where the cheetah girls may be. Oh, isn't this a magically big euphorbia here? Now, in Swahili, its nickname is Mitiya Maziwa, which basically means the milk tree. Now, it doesn't have any milk. It does have a very poisonous milky latex, however, um, that drips out. Now, it can be used for the treatment of warts. You dab that milky latex on the wart, it'll just... If you break off a big branch of it, as long as you don't get the latex on yourself, you'll be okay. Uh, you can use it to get dinner. Uh, if you find a small pool that's cut off um, in a lagger or in a river like the Talek, where there's lots of isolated rock pools, you go through that branch into there and it will kill all the fish and as long as you gut them properly you can eat them with no problem whatsoever okay woof after that rains passed it suddenly become very hot okay well we're gonna keep looking for Amani's girls while we do that let's send you back to a different set of musketeers from the one I had this morning. It's all very confusing, isn't it? Between the cheetahs and, and the lions in one particular country, um, as well as the fact that there are musketeer coalitions pretty much everywhere in Africa. I know that, that there's at least one other cheetah coalition called the musketeers in Botswana. So it's, it's a popular name, let's put it that way. Although at least in this situation we have the right number of musketeers. That does make me feel a little bit better, slightly more accurate. But the gang's all here and the wind is howling. Brent said that we've probably escaped the storm. It's one thing that I've learnt out here. You think you're safe and then the storm bounces off the escarpment like a, a billiard ball and comes barreling back in our direction whenever we're in this area. So I'm not convinced yet. I'm not sold on the idea. We might have escaped for now, but I think it might be coming back our way. I can barely see the escarpment that way, that direction is home. But it's okay. We're in, the, we're in a good place. Um, Joy, I would 
I actually don't know exactly whether all four of the Musketeer Coalition are brothers. I can tell you that there's a great likelihood that they are related to each other, but it's not absolutely necessary. I'm sure that there are people out there who know the background of the Musketeers slightly better than myself. Essentially, male lions are most likely to form a coalition with brothers and cousins of the same age. So when they leave the pride, they leave the pride together and will invariably stay together in a group because that's what their instinct tells them. But male lions are not fussy and if they move out on their own, um, they will try and find themselves a, a young group of males to join or perhaps another young individual and essentially create their own coalition. So with, with lions it is not an absolute necessity that they are related to each other. However, once they do form a coalition, then blood is irrelevant. Whether they are brothers, cousins, or previously strangers, they're all joined together in the brotherhood. And the signs of affection between male lion coalitions, in fact, are almost clearer than the affection that you get between lionesses in a pride. They're constantly nuzzling each other, rubbing heads with each other, also, importantly, passing on their scent and essentially almost scent marking each other. But those bonds will last for the rest of their lives. And it becomes, it gets to the point where their survival is essential on the other members. It takes a brotherhood to defend a territory against all sorts of marauding males. Now, we've seen how they're limping, all of them. I would say that some of those injuries, particularly in my mind, the big gash on the back of that one male's leg, I would say that that likely came from a hunting wound. So, in other words, when he was hunting something like a buffalo or a hippo, he fell foul of its horns or its teeth, and as a result was left with quite a bad injury. But it could also be from warring with another coalition. No, see, I, th I think I might have got your name wrong. Um, how do the vets decide which animal to treat? I'm not 100% sure exactly how that decision is made. Uh, within South Africa, I would be able to tell you very easily that as long as that injury has been induced by humans, then the vets will treat it, regardless of the animal concerned, whether it is an antelope or whether it is a lion. Out here, I would suggest that with limited resources, not all animals can be treated for natural injuries. I mean, goodness gracious, can you imagine if a vet was wandering around during the Great Migration, trying to treat every single wildebeest with a broken leg? or a crocodile-related injury, it would be impossible. So, essentially, I guess the animals are prioritized based on, on numbers and based on, dare I say, status, I guess. But numbers would be the, the, the sort of defining feature. So there are less lions than there are wildebeest, there are less lions than there are topi or zebra, and therefore they rank higher on the priority scale, with a rhino being right up at the top, cheetah being up at the top as well, elephant, lion, leopard, and probably buffalo to an extent, uh, to a degree, but I think it would very much depend upon the circumstances. Even a hyena, I think, might not fall under the treatment area, but I don't know. Matt, no kill here, uh, and you might have noticed when the males got up, and at the moment they are particularly flat, but you might have noticed when they were up earlier that they all had quite thin bellies. So there's no kill here. They've just gathered together as often or regularly happens with male lion coalitions. A lot of the time it happens when we don't see them. It happens during the evening time uh, or at night where they meet up, bond, I don't know what they talk about, boy things, and then they go off their separate ways. Which lioness is looking particularly good, perhaps, or where you can find the best, where the best water joint in town is, or I, I don't know. But at the moment, we're just lucky, because they're just gathered together. 
So while we sit patiently and wait to see whether the musketeers have anything in store for us this afternoon, let's go from something with a feathery mane to something with a general covering of feathers. Here we go. It is a male Cory Bustard. You can actually hear... Can you hear that? It sounds like a drum. Now, he's displaying, looking for a girlfriend. Now, I just wanted to make sure we could get a, a really good view of him before we try to get a bit closer. And you can just hear a doop, 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 doop. There he is again. Okay, I'm going to sneak a bit closer. Now, Cory Bastards are polygamous birds. And sometimes, if you get really lucky, you can get a group of males displaying for dominance. Uh, normally, it's, it's quite easy to see who's the dominant one. But when they do have two that are sort of very similar in size and strength, they'll actually sort of chest bump each other to see who wins while puffed up like that. Now, I'm hoping when we get a bit closer, we'll be able to hear that doop, 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 doop more clearly. Oh, he is off. He's really got his neck puffed out today. Now, we do see Cory Bustards often in the Mara. We don't often see them, the males displaying like this, though. So it is quite special, quite a treat. And you're looking for cheetah, you never know what you might find. Wait, is there another bird there? There's a girl. He's displaying for a female. How awesome is that? You can see her there. Aren't you a pretty birdie? Well, he definitely thinks so. Now watch as he... There we go. Trying to make himself as impressive as possible for that female. By pounding on his drum. Well, Bill's wondering, how does he select his feathered female? Like with most bird species, he doesn't have a choice. She does all the selection. And she's going to select the most impressive-looking, biggest, strongest male. Okay, they're, they're very, very calm. Now, as quite a lot of the Cory Busters here are, so... Might as well try to get a little bit closer. This is very, very cool. As I said, not something you see too often. And Jahawi spotted him on the horizon. He's like, what is that? And I was like, is that a person standing there? No, it's the world's heaviest flying bird. Well, there we go. Joy was just wondering that. It is indeed the world's heaviest flying bird. Now, before, behind him, we could see some of the villages um, to the north of the park. So if you want a nice screenshot, we're going to line you up a village-free screenshot, and also a frontal one. <laughs> Mr. Gohan says, I hope she doesn't friends zone him. Oh, there he is, beating on his drum again. Keep quiet so we can hear it. Now, she could have already mated with him as the 
males will continue to display after the copulation, which is less than a second. But the build-up can take hours, sometimes days. But when they get close to mating, the female will lie down next to him. And uh, the male will then sort of fit around her for a good five or six minutes, pecking her and uh, sort of jumping from side to side. And then he will lower himself on top of her and then still continue to peck her for a few minutes um, before um, he does the deed. Mr. Zero says he looks like a king with a cape and a neck ruffle. Well, he's definitely got his crown all up. How cool is this? This is definitely not something you see every day. wondering does he display to the female when there's another male nearby often yes often just by being the most impressive at displaying he can get rid of any potential uh, potential competition or other suitors to the female Doesn't seem to have his rhythm down, does he? He's not. He's not very. He's not very rhythmic in his drum beating. Let's have a look. I'm just wanted to have a quick look around. It doesn't look like there's any other competition. As I said, this can sometimes go on for days upon days. But it is still very, very cool to see. And even, even if maybe he's already won uh, the the female, he's still going to sit there and proudly beat on his drum for up to an hour or two afterwards. Well, that was very cool. We're going to continue our search for some cheetahs and say goodbye to the Cory Bastards. So, while we look for our ninth and tenth cheetah of the day, let's go across to Jamie with the Musketeer Lions. That's not a bad sentence, is it? While we look for the ninth and the tenth cheater of the day. My goodness me. We are seriously spoiled for choice out here. So while Brent goes off in search of his umpteenth cheater for the day, we are not going to go in search of anything else, I don't think, this afternoon. I think you'll all agree that a bit of patience with these boys, especially because they are quite restless this afternoon. They are moving about. They are up and down. I think we should stick here as long as possible. There is the added advantage, of course, of the fact that the rain is not here, which helps to make that decision particularly clear to me. So I mentioned the names earlier, but for our new viewers, I think that perhaps it might be a nice idea to reiterate. Scar is pretty obvious. So Scar is the one with the big scar over his face, and he's the one lying on the left there. You can't see him because he's hidden his face behind the grass. But there's four of them that belong to this coalition. Scar, the easily recognizable one. Hunter, Morani, M-O-R-A-N-I, and Sikio, S-I-K-I-O. So those are the four members of the Musketeer Coalition. And as I said, I've, all see I've seen all four individually at different times, but never all together like this. You've seen it with, for our regular viewers, um, you've seen it with the Birmingham boys on, in the Sabi Sand, how initially we used to see all four of them together all the time. And once they really established themselves as the dominant coalition and their territory size increased, they were more often apart than they were together, and it was a rare treat to see all four of them around. So all five of them actually were together in the beginning, now unfortunately down to four. So now we can really truly appreciate just what a special sight this is. Mm. 
Mkha, it's an interesting thing. Yes, when male lions take over a pride, they do occasionally kill the sub-adult lionesses. And you are right in that it seems slightly illogical in that if they were to wait just a few months, then they would be able to mate with those females as well and have an even better chance of, of um, producing offspring. But it does happen, not always, that there is that really awkward cut-off point for young lions when a male so let's start at the beginning for, for viewers who have perhaps only just discovered the joys of safari. When a male lion coalition, oh he's got a sore paw, there's Scar, giving us a very clear demonstration. Oh, the flies are sitting on his scar and it looks like it's opened up a little bit as well. It definitely doesn't look too good actually. Sorry, hold off. Sorry Mkar, give me a sec. Ouch! Yeah open injury over that wound as well and that's inevitable because of course a scar is a vulnerable spot on a male lion or on any any creature and it opens up more easily and gets and gets infected more easily in a lot of cases especially because there's no fur around there to protect it okay back to Mkar's question when a male lion coalition takes over a territory they kill all of the cubs from the previous males and they do that to bring the females back into estrus so that they can mate with them and that they can produce their own cubs it seems cruel but it's nature's way of in ensuring that there isn't any inbreeding and essentially ensuring that a male lion in his lifetime gets to pass on his genes the sub-adult female question is tricky. There's a cut-off point at around about two years old when those lionesses are pretty much safe. But something that happened and something that we saw when during the Birmingham boy takeover was that when male lions come in, they are so pumped up and full of aggression and testosterone, particularly at a young age, that a lot of the time even adult lionesses fall victim to their fury. So if the lionesses try to fight back, if they try to defend their cubs, the male lions are so overwrought, oh he's up, so overwrought that occasionally they actually wind up killing adults, let alone sub-adults as well. So it is a difficult one, especially when the males are young and inexperienced. Look at him, he's just got the most characteristic hair. I think you could identify him pretty easily from that mane, even if you couldn't see the scar. Don't you agree? It's floppy. Got the floppiest mane of any male lion. I don't know, I think everyone had better ask Tristan. I don't know if Tristan is driving this afternoon, but I think you better ask Tristan where he thinks Scar's mane falls on the fluffometer pretty high up there I think in fact might even be around about the toy pom scale Paul I don't spend enough time around all of their territory to know exactly so Paul yes I think they are definitely under pressure from this particular side where we are at the moment which is the I guess you'd say the the southwestern corner of their territory you know those two lo two young chelly males the one with the collar now we've seen them mating with females very very close to where we are now so that would mean that they are potential threats to the four older boys. Now I suspect that the four older boys together, those two young boys, would be absolutely no match for the show of strength. But if they were to catch one of the musketeers on their own, two young males, the musketeers are already a bit limpy, but a couple of old injuries that might slow them down slightly, then yes, that would be, that would be a potential threat. As to the male lion coalitions on the other side of the river, because remember the musketeers' territory stretches over the Mara River, I'm not 100% sure. I'm not sure what the male lion dynamic is on that side of the river. I don't spend much time. In fact, I've only really been to Paradise Plain mm, twice in the entire six months I've been in the Mara, so I'm not sure exactly what threats are presented to them from that area. Um, forgive me for a, one second, I just want to see what's going on on the other side there. I think... Can't 
quite work it out. There's people out of the vehicle, but there's rangers with them. So I don't think anything too serious. Just wanted to check and see whether they needed any help. But they don't. And they're far enough away that the lions are not in any way bothered by them. Sorry, Faith, what were you going to say before I got wholeheartedly distracted? Hey, boys. Oh, okay. I'm going to sit patiently. I'm go it's going to be my turn to play the patience game for now. Let's go and have a look at what other bird Brent has found for you this time. Uh, there was a bird. It is gone. Uh, let's see where did you see where it went. Oh, Dad, it was sitting so nicely. Uh, it was a rosy-throated long claw right next to us. But I think it is now a gone claw. Yeah, I know, it's done a despairing act. There are quite a few of them up here on the ridge, so I will keep checking. Oh, but we do have both gazelle species up ahead. We've got some Tommies and some Grants or a grants that I can see. Still no sign, unfortunately, of the gills. Here we go. Hello, gazelles. TS is wondering, do we get a lot of rain this time of the year? A fair amount, TS, a fair amount. It's the small rainy season, um, but the more rain from May, oh, sorry, not from May, um, from the end of, end of February, March, April, May, um, towards the beginning of June is the, the, the main rainy season. This is the small rains. You have two rainy seasons here in Kenya, the big rains and the small rains. Okay, gazelles, we're the things that eat you. If we get no luck with the, with the ladies, I think we might see if I can find my favorite male lion coalition, the Billa Shaka Boys. It's just so nice to say that. The Billa Shaka Boys. Now, of course, they also are a potential threat to those lions that Jamie is with. Uh, they're not too far up from where they where they are, so ooh, let's go see what Jamie thinks about the Billa Shakas pushing into Musketeer territory. Oh, that's exactly what I was thinking about, by the way. Um, I just got thoroughly distracted by whatever goings on are happening in my eye line. But yes, absolutely, the Billa Shaka boys. Does anyone know what Billa Shaka means? I do, and the only reason I know that is because Faith told me a couple of days ago. Possibly even yesterday. I've lost track of time. Billa Shaka is the perfect name, in my mind, for those six young males. Without a doubt. That's literally what it means. I'm not just saying it without a doubt. It's, it's, it's a good name. I mean, Billa Shaka, without a doubt. That is what it means. So yes, the six male lions, six young male lions, they're a threat to these boys, they're a potential threat to the triangle boys, fang and half tail and their ilk, up towards around the angama pride and around the sausage tree pride. It remains to be seen where they seen where they wind up. I think they could pretty much go wherever they want to if they stay together. Holden, welcome. Holden has obviously just jumped on board while we're sitting with the musketeer male lions. Have they eaten yet? No, they're hungry. Uh, particularly Scar. He, he looks to be rather empty. In fact, they're all pretty empty-bellied. Now, when you look at a lion like this, it's always slightly tricky to tell 
because of course when they're lying down you can't really see just how empty their bellies are when they're very full that is immediately apparent even if they are lying down but when they are at varying stages between semi full and empty it becomes more tricky but no they haven't eaten what are they going to eat well it remains to be seen the Mongoro pride of lionesses is not far from here nor is the paradise pride it wouldn't be above a male lion to go off and steal whatever the ladies are eating but they're more than capable of eating and or hunting and catching dinner for themselves with four of them like this anything is on the cards they probably would ignore a small antelope but a zebra a buffalo buffalo would be a good meal for them a giraffe potentially I have not seen one lion giraffe kill in my time in the Mara first thing I saw was a leopard giraffe kill which was unexpected giraffe hippopotamus as the evening falls four massive male lions like this first of all have rather large appetites and secondly have a, a supreme show of strength Swapna, isn't it funny that you should ask that, Manu? <laughs> we, Manu and I were talking about this um, just earlier on, and we were talking about the lion's mane. So I'm afraid I might have butchered your name, but Swapna is essentially wanting to know a little bit more about whether or not there's any relationship between the color of a lion's mane and a sign of strength or perhaps um, good, what would be the word, good genetics. There is something very interesting and this is a study that's been carried out a few times by a few different people, organizations, universities. Lionesses prefer dark maned males. That's not to say they won't mate with light maned males, but lionesses prefer dark maned males. Most male lions will go darker with age. There is a certain inevitability to that, but not all of them. So there's also a level of genetic connection there as well. So most males will go darker with age. It is a sign of a good nutrition. It is a sign of a healthy male lion, but again, genetics play a role. Whether or not a male lion has a full mane of hair is also area and temperature dependent. I must say though, within the Mara that has on average a far lower temperature than say in South Africa or at least the low felt of South Africa, there are some really, really magnificent male lions out here. Oh, I suppose there are in South, there definitely are in South Africa as well, but the Notch Boys, the Musketeers, the four kilometer boys, they are all exceptionally good looking lions, even though it is a bit colder. Striking, I think, is the term I would use. So, most of the young males that we see out here are blonde for now. Young males, I mean. Most of them will go dark as they grow older. Fascinating to me that that question was asked. It was well timed. It was a very good thought. Okay. Again, while we sit playing the patience game with our musketeer males, let's go across to Brent, who has got, I suppose you could call them, their arch nemesis. We do. We've got a lovely little group of hyenas. They've got a den close to here, but after that little rainstorm that Jahawi and I got wet in a bit earlier, uh, they seem to just be enjoying being out on the open, in the open, sorry, not on the open, my goodness. And uh, sitting right on top uh, the western side of the ridge. Now the den is behind us in the rocks, but they're wandering around. They were being not too playful. Some of them were lying in some mud and just got up started for a little stroll which of course is bad news for us if we're looking for cheetah and the cheetah do not like the hyenas at all
And it is exquisitely beautiful up here today. Now, this is one of the, the larger clans of hyenas in the Mara. Um, this ridge clan, they can, I think they can muster close to 100 when it gets going. But there is a lot of competition amongst the hyena clans in the Mara. They're very big clans. This area in particular, you've got a very big clan down on Paradise Plain. Uh, you've got another big clan towards Double Crossing and this big clan up on the ridge. So there is definitely lots of competition uh, between the hyenas. So we've got a cu couple of adults and some sub-adults. And it's a sub-adult being groomed there. Mrs. Zero would like to know which one is Howard. Mrs. Zero, all of them are Howard. It's Howard 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. All Howard. Where you can never get confused when you're naming a hyena when they're all named Howard. Howard can be a boy, Howard can be a girl. Oh, and that Howard's having a roll. Oh, that looks good. Itchy back. Oof, when the sun comes out of the clouds, it is really warmer. Cayman would like to know why do hyenas roll in the mud? Because it feels good. And also to cool down. They like lying in mud when it gets hot. Especially when they've got fat bellies from eating too much meat. And they'll just go lie in the mud and digest. I don't think it's going to be too long if this sun stays out before the hyenas head back towards the mud. While they contemplate what they... Oh, wait. Before we move on, what is on top of that tree there? It looks like a martial eagle. From this distance, let's have a look with the binos. You know why it looks like a martial eagle? Because it is a martial eagle. Quite a long way off. Have how erect they stand. Oof. Wow. There are a couple of thousand wildebeest down towards the the Musiara Marsh that I didn't even realise were there. So I think if I was a cheeser, I would go down there. So we're gonna start heading that way. Oh, Howard number six has arrived. Hello, Howard number six. Let's keep moving. Uh, while we leave the hyenas and head down towards the Musiara area, let's go back to the musketeers who are hopefully thinking about getting moving sometime this century. Oh. It, it doesn't look like it. In fact, it looks almost as though they're enjoying the wind blowing through their mane and probably have very little desire to move. And I think at this point, since most of them are hidden, after this we'll probably leave them and then come back towards the end of the sunset safari. We'll make a decision in a moment. I think we'll go and look for other things, perhaps show you a few elephants and some antelope, and then come back as it gets towards the later hour of the evening when the lions are more likely to be up and about. I would like to get you a screenshot of all four of the musketeers walking shoulder to shoulder down the road. That's what I'm after. Brent, a fully grown rhino... 
unlikely but possibly if the rhino was perhaps injured or a little under the weather. So Brent's question is, could these four males kill a, a rhino? I assume you mean an adult rhino. Obviously, yes, they could absolutely kill a young rhino, especially because they would be able to distract the mother with all four of them acting together. But an adult rhino, it doesn't often happen that lions take on rhinoceros. The skin is thicker than that of a hippopotamus. It's it's a harder animal to, to actually manage to tackle and ultimately to do enough damage to be able to kill it. So that skin is phenomenally tough on a rhinoceros. Very, very difficult to get through. So while I think it would probably be possible, I don't think it would be very, very likely. And, I mean, that's one of the reasons why rhino have such a high life expectancy, that they are essentially pretty much safe from all predators out here, with limited exceptions. I mean, I've seen lions often practicing their hunting skills on lions. Oh, what? <laughs> well, that too. I've seen lions practice hunting skills on rhino before. Youngsters actually jumping up and riding on the rhino's back for a little while before being shaken off again. The worst part of that was that it w I was pretty new to guiding back in the day and I assumed that that sort of thing happened all the time. How wrong I was. It's not something that you get to see all that frequently. Paul, yes, these male lions would fight with each other um, over food, over females. Um, if one of them happens to lie down upon the other one when it's not in a very good mood, internal scraps are common. Uh, they are more common with relatively newly territorial coalitions than they are with the older coalitions, the more established coalitions. That's not to say that there is a strict hierarchy within established coalitions because that changes, it's not really, you couldn't even really call it a hierarchy, but essentially the, the male lion that gets to mate with the female is the one who's been with her first. He is the one that's better fed at that moment. He's the one in better condition at that moment. And he might tire and actually one of the other coalition members will move in. But yes, they do scrap internally, sometimes actually causing <coughs> injuries that could look quite severe and occasionally are if they become infected. But they usually pull their punches when they fight with each other. So it, it will never really get to the point where there's the the possibility of serious injury or possibly even death. Whereas between males, oh boy, hmm. between rival male coalitions, blind fights often are fights to the death, or at least to the point where the male is so badly injured that their chances of survival are dramatically decreased. We don't know where these injuries came from. We've got absolutely no idea. At least the fresh ones. I think that the Bilashakas are a good call. Uh, Dina, I'm not sure. I honestly am not sure. I don't know which one is the injured one. I know obviously that it's not Scar, but I'm not sure which of the four, four the three other musketeers it is. I haven't had a proper chance to have a look at him. I, had, I admit to being so utterly distracted by the sheer joy of seeing all of them together, I, I didn't properly observe him. And I haven't spent enough time with the musketeers to be able to straight away tell the difference between them. I'm pretty sure, though, that you will find the answer is sent through during the course of the sunset safari. Somebody out there will know which male lion is the one with the massive stitched-up wound. Now, apparently there's a suggestion that it's Hunter from Stan. Stan or Sam? Not that I'm in any way saying, okay, Stan, yeah, but then Stan, it would be Hunter. Okay, there we go. We have our answer from Stan. Thank you to Stan. Um, Stan is telling me that it's Hunter. That helps tremendously. Thank you, Stan. So it's Hunter. 
that has the nasty injury on his back limb. I wonder when that was stitched up. They looked like old stitches to me, or oldish stitches. Joy watching all the way in Hong Kong. Wouldn't it be quite late for you there? How many hours ahead is Hong Kong? Oh, it's only four now. Um, Joy, <sighs> possibly. I don't know. I don't know whether or not it would happen. So essentially, Joy is wondering if the male, if the lions were to attack a rhino, would the rangers step in? Pro probably. Would they? We're not saying should. We're saying would. Would they step in? And the answer is is probably yes. But I'm not sure on that. And it's not really for me to answer. It's not really ultimately my decision at all. We we simply here as Fari Live, we are simply observers. And our job is to help you to fall in love with the animals. Ours is not to interfere with what the authorities of this area choose to do. But yes, I suspect they possibly would. Virginia, I don't know which male lion is the oldest male lion in the Mara area, but I'm pretty certain that it's not Scar. Uh, Scar, I don't think, is actually that old. Although he is reaching sort of the point where he's been around for a fair few, a fair amount of time. But I'm not sure who the oldest lion in the Mara is, but I'm pretty certain it's not him. I have a suspicion that the Notch Boys, one of them unfortunately is no longer with us. I have a suspicion that the Notch Boys were older, if I remember correctly. Uh, and again, Stan, if you know which or if you have a rough idea as to which male lion would be the oldest in the Mara, I don't think it's Scar. And that, of course, is in, in the areas where people are most active. There are certain corners of the, the Mara National Reserve, for example, where people hardly ever go. So who knows, down towards that sort of area, what what lions are about. Okay guys, what do you think? I think we leave them for now. We go and have a little loop around, go and look at some ostrich or whatever else I can find in the distance and then come back. One of the animals I was aiming to find you this afternoon was an elephant, but it sounds like perhaps Brent has beaten me to it. Yes, I've been looking for everything except elephants. I've been looking for cats, but we're finding everything but cats this afternoon. So you can just see the Ellie's with that lovely sky behind them. Well, an elephant with a lovely sky behind it. The rest of the herd are just off to the left of us. Enjoying the lovely lush grass. There has definitely been quite a bit of rain in this area since I was last year, which is of course quite a while ago, and definitely more area, rain here than in the Talek area. And the grass here is just emerald green. And that's obviously what's causing the big herds of wildebeest to hang around double crossing and the marsh. I mean, every time I look into the distance towards the marsh, or looking at something else, I suddenly see all these little black specks I realize that is a massive herd of wildebeest. So there's still wildebeest here. Um, the loiter herd, I haven't moved on. The elephants, probably a little bit grumpy about that. Elephants don't like wildebeest. Um, Joe and I were just chatting about when we spotted the eddies, um, how many times we'd seen elephants chase wildebeest and whatnot. And uh, Joe said he'd heard about uh, elephants actually flicking wildebeest when they got really up, up 
upset with him and saying that would just be a really incredible thing to see. Okay, I see. I'm going to change my route a little bit. Dawn is wondering how do we stay safe and then you broke up a bit, um, their faith, in an open vehicle. Well, the animals don't have instinctive res there we go, instinctive responses to the vehicle. A vehicle's only been around about a hundred years, but the most important way to stay safe is to read the animal's behavior. If an animal's upset, we give it space. Um, but I'm looking at these elephants we're coming up upon now. I can see from her body language that she's very relaxed. Um, there's no erection in her tail. This looks like, oh, she's quite an old female. Just looking at how her head's drooping. Tall shoulders, but an old girl. Hello, big girl. Oof, Shem, you are an old girl. And you can just see, when elephants become old, you start seeing uh, the sort of hollows in their head start becoming more pronounced and the skin becomes a little bit more baggy. And see, she's holding her head quite low below her shoulders. It's probably probably her last calf, um, this little one here. It's probably oh, he's about three. Well, she's about three. But I don't think she's probably going to have another calf after this. Just judging from her age. Hey, old lady. Well, we're going to let our old lady meander on. We're going to do the same um, and head down eventually towards the Mara River and then head back towards Musiara on the Paradise Plain. Maybe the Cheetah Girls have gone down there. That is one of their favorite spots. Maybe the Bilashaka Boys are around. Who knows? But the one thing is for certain, there are lots of wildebeest around down towards the marsh. Streamtube is wondering, do angry male elephants ever give the driver problems? Hello, hyena. You are very fat. Yes, you are. You are, you are obese. You need to go and diet. Fat hyena. You're not a hyena, you're a fat hyena. Yes, go for a jog. Off you go. Um, oh, there's another, there's, oh, not so obese, but another hyena. This will all be part of the same clan we saw earlier. Yes, 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 yes. Hello. You're not, you're not a fat hyena. You're, you're just a hyena. Um, but StreamTube is wondering about angry male elephants giving vehicles problems. Uh, strange enough, it's, it's, it's far more often you're going to get yourself in a dangerous situation with a female elephant with a calf. And in areas where they might be under stress due to lack of food, um, confrontation with people, uh, you never know. So it's always important to, to judge each individual elephant sighting on its own because the same elephant that's fine today might have had a bad night and is not going to be fine tomorrow so you need to watch their body language uh, and uh, then make up your choice from there so yes sometimes angry male elephants and angry female elephants um, can give the vehicles a bit of a, a shove I have not had uh, a situation since I've been doing the live safaris once where I've actually felt in danger from elephants at all and I have been uh, I have had some warning charges um, and whatnot but again it's how you deal with those situations and uh, most important thing is to stay calm and uh, sometimes use some harsh language elephants listen to you you shout at them um, it's more the tone of the voice and stuff. Sometimes banging the side of the car works to stop a charge. Um, and again, as I said, you have to read every situation independently. You can't have a blanket rule for everything. Well, it seems like Jamie has decided the musketeers are napping for this century. So she's gone and found, well, we found the, the heaviest flying bird. She's now found the biggest bird. 
wasn't hard to find, but I just thought it was such a lovely continuation on the topic of body language. So while mostly it's important for us to watch bo the body language of animals for safety and the animal's safety, sometimes there's a lesson to be learned. So ladies, I'd like you to take a, out a notepad and a pen and jot some notes down on the flirting technique from this female ostrich. Note how she, she's acting completely disinterested, but at the same time, just a delicate forward bend, she's just eating, but at the same time, every now and again, wafting her wings to remind the male that she's there, and perhaps show off what, in ostrich terms, might be considered to be her best asset. It's interesting, I always find it thoroughly entertain, entertaining to watch the flirtatious behavior of an ostrich. They are not subtle about the entire process. So you'll find that there's the, the signs are very clearly given and very clearly received at times by the male. Now what surprises me is that there's actually two females here. Look, she's also, she is also cooling herself down, so I'm being a little bit unfair to our flirtatious female. Um, she is also trying to cool herself in the hot air, but that's not her only, not her only reason. There's the male in the middle, and there is the slightly more conservative female on the left. My dear girl, you're going to have to keep up. The lady in front of you is flashing a bit of thigh. Holden? <laughs> Sorry, I really did go down the realm of the ridiculous there. Uh, there's one last thing I want to show you and then I will talk about Holden's question. And that is the pink flush that the sight of um, that amount of exposed ostrich thigh has achieved in the male. So that is... Yeah, he's not too pink actually. I've seen, I've seen stronger blushes. Oh no, wait, there we go. Look at that. Look at that. Flushed, but still hungry. <laughs> Renee Costa, you say that the ostrich should write a dating, dating manual. Um... Yes, I'm, I'm not quite sure what it would include. Ladies, when... <laughs> I, I, I don't know. Wave, wave your wings around. Look, look keen, but not too keen. Make it clear that the, uh, the food is just as important as, as his attention, perhaps. Silly, silly. Jamie's being very silly. There's one last thing I wanted to comment on, and that is the fact that you saw earlier Brent's display with the Cory Busted and the breeding call. I believe, Faith, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that it was roaring, or at least making that roar-like sound. Okay. So, there's something similar. within the ostrich sound. I'm going to stop that right there because he's looking around thoroughly unimpressed that there might be a potential rival his attention diverted from his lady friend um, and immediately looking around for for the 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 responsible caller i've completely forgotten whose question i was meant to be answering i'm so sorry we we're talking about uh, there was a question about life expectancy of ostriches so when you look at this ostrich this ostrich has reached sexual maturity sorry 
Holden. So Holden, this, this ostrich has reached sexual maturity. They do it around about three or four, but it's only really when they're at this age, six or seven, that they're ready to mate. And if I remember correctly, you're looking at around about 15 or so years for a an ostrich's life expectancy in the wild. <laughs> Apologies, I got so distracted by my sheer strange train of thought. Yes, make sure those feathers are all in place. Nobody likes uh, an ill-groomed man. That's not true. I'm sorry. I'm I am completely talking utter nonsense. There's some part of my brain that is just tinging away in the background. Life expectancy of ostriches is much longer. I don't know where I, why I said 15, I'm talking utter nonsense, it's 40. It's up to 40 years. They live a long time. I know because I've encountered some problem ostriches that have remained problem ostriches for a considerable period of time. What utter nonsense I'm talking. I'm so sorry, Holden. I don't know where that came from. Right, I didn't do it. We were talking about breeding season and whether or not they have a strict breeding season. I'm actually not sure in this area. Now, typically within South Africa, they will, they will have a breeding season. But I'm not too sure. Within the Mara, with, with the two rainy seasons, I'm not too sure exactly how the ostrich breeding season plays out. I'm trying to rack my brains because I did a whole load of research on the differences between Kenya and South Africa. Oh, both wings now. My goodness, is he just not getting the hint? Oh, or, or is he? Or is there just a really attractive bit of food there? Oh, no. Oh, no. Her poor dented ego. <laughs> How tragic. My heart, my heart just broke. Oh, you poor, poor girl. <laughs> I am, I am being very silly this afternoon. I'm sorry. Um, I think she's cooling down as well. I think that there is dual purpose here. I think she's just feeling a little bit hot and I don't blame her. It is quite hot. It is quite warm under the the boiling sun. I still think there's something a little bit flirtatious. So I didn't do it. I'm not sure about when exactly they would breed if they have a strict breeding season. I suspect that they do and I imagine that it is like most birds around the the rainy season and probably both rainy seasons potentially if they haven't managed to breed in the first one but I'm really I'm really not sure I'm busy checking now on my birding app and it tells me that the mating season begins in March or April so just before the big rains and will cease in September. So why haven't we seen one baby ostrich, I ask you? What have we been doing wrong? If that's the breeding season, March and April to September. I'll just check that in the bird book. That's what it tells me. Hmm. Well, we know that in this area there's a lioness with a taste for ostrich eggs. I say that, she found one, but you never know. Perhaps they have been responsible for the fact that we haven't seen one single baby ostrich. March to September. I've been here since June. Have we put one baby ostrich on the screen during on these live safaris in the Mara? I don't think we have. Unless I missed something somewhere. How is that possible with the amount of time that we see ostriches? 
I just assumed their breeding season was coming now, and that's why we hadn't seen any. Hmm. Mysterious. Why aren't there any little sub-adult ostriches wandering about? Or semi-sub-adult ostriches? Strange. But a bit perplexed by the accuracy of that. I'll have to ask somebody who's been here a long time. That is what I shall do. Okay, we were talking, by the way, about um, about ostrich nests and where they lay their nests. Here's the interesting thing about ostriches. So we've seen the two females here, and there might actually be a more specific explanation for the fact that one female is displaying while the other is not. Male ostriches have harems, kind of like impala, or um, or like a, a zebra during breeding season, but he has a dominant female within that harem. He has a he has a pair bond with one particular female, so it's quite a complex thing. Now, although he has multiple females, he essentially has one favorite, and he, what he will do is he will dig a, a pit on the ground for the nest. And then as a, the, the dominant female will lay her eggs, and then the other females will lay their eggs in that particular pit as well, in large harems. So we, it could be that we're looking at the dominant female here, potentially. Perhaps she has the right to display. I'm not 100% au fait with, with ostrich breeding behavior, but that's a possible suggestion as to why we're seeing that behavior from one or not the other, and not the other. Swapna, yes, it is indeed a myth. Um, and it is a myth that has been around for a very, very long time. So the myth is that the ostriches stick their head in the ground when confronted with danger. Now, I don't know the exact origin of the myth, but I can. it is safe to say that ostriches do not. If they were to try that here, they'd find themselves with quite a serious headache. The ground is rather hard or else a nostril full of mud after the rains. So I don't know where it came from. Maybe it's the possibility that particularly young ostriches will often use their camouflage. They'll sit down and they'll try and hide away from a potential threat. But I don't know exactly where that myth originated from. That would be my guess. But I do know that I remember reading somewhere that that particular myth has been around for a long, a very, very long time, and of course then perpetuated initially by by theatre and then or plays and then onwards through the sort of cartoons and films where the ostrich slams its head into the ground. But no, they don't do that. Okay, we're going to move on in search of other fascinating creatures to show you. In the meantime, let's go and see whether Brent has had any luck in his search for the umpteenth cheetah. No luck, but we have many, many zebra. A topian wildebeest around. So, where there's prey, there's got to be a predator. Well, that's how I'm rolling and there's someone I can have a chat to, see if they've seen anything. But it is absolutely gorgeous down here. I mean, this, so difficult, but outside of the Sand River, I think this is one of my favorite areas in the Mara. What is making dust like that? Oh, hello, baby topies. Oh, no, it's a zebra chasing each other around. But with all these wonderful animals comes many, many flies. So lots and lots of zebra. 
And as we head further towards the marsh itself, lots and lots of wildebeest. I mean, it is just, just beautiful. Oh, getting a mm, absolutely attacked by the flies at the moment, though. Two two zebra. It is really, really gorgeous here. There's fluffy clouds, plenty of game, plenty of flies. Although I know Jamie did mention that I forgot my hairbrush on three days across the river. And um, it's definitely going to be fun trying to get those knots out, but I'm sure I'll manage. Uh, Kathy says the sky is so, so freaky. Oh, I don't think it's that freaky. I think it's quite common at rainy season skies. Oh, pretty. I, I was very confused there why it would be freaky. Indeed, I agree with you. It is very, very pretty. Absolutely gorgeous, in fact. Not freaky at all. Oh. Look at that. Well, escaping. It's only popped a head out of a hole. Hello, hyena. Lots of hyenas around here. I don't think this is a den. I just think it was a conveniently cool place to lie. And as you can see, there's very little shade around here. Sorry to disturb. Looks very upset with me. I'm going to keep moving before it gets too, mu too much more upset. Oreo Boo says, I heard zebra are black with white stripes. It's true. No, no, no. They're white with black stripes. Definitely white with black stripes. Of course, I'm joking. They can be white with black stripes or black with white stripes. Uh, why don't we ask the zebra? Zebra, what are you? I don't think that male zebra actually minds. So, whatever you would prefer. White with black stripes or black with white stripes. I don't think the zebra minds either way. Now, I saw some vehicles under the only tree on this plane, which means there's either people having lunch or a little break, or there's a big cat there. I'm going with big cat. Now, the next tricky thing is we're trying to figure out, is it on our side of the lugger or on the other side of the lugger? Hmm. Where's that car coming from? On the other side of the lugger. So we're going to cross the lugger. Scarlett's wondering, will the grass remain green during summer? Indeed it will, Scarlett. Um, you might have a little bit of brown grass between January, February, where the rain there's a break between the two rainy seasons. But overall, the Mara remains pretty green for most of the year. Oh, we've got some mud to contend with, by the looks of things. No, we're going to go around it. No need in taking the marshmallow pin away from Taylor McCurdy. She deserves it. She earned it. It belongs with her. I know Taylor, if she's watching, would be squealing something in, in retort. A little common sandpiper here right on the ground next to us. For those of you who might be missing common sandpiper from your bird lists, see the shoulder? There's a little C that goes around on the shoulder. That's how you can tell the common sandpiper very easily. OK. 
Okay, and then we have some spurwing lap wings as well before we head off. Now, far more common than the blacksmith lap wing, oh, off it goes, in this area, although they, sh they both compete for very similar habitats. Although we do see blacksmiths from time to time. Now, I'm gonna try and get towards that tree. I think there has to be a big cat there. I'm just trying to figure a way not to join or take the Marshmallow Queen title from the Hurdy Birdy McCurdy. Now, I don't know if Taylor told you, but she actually phoned me while I was on leave, while she was stuck in the mud, to find out if I knew anyone who could help pull her out. Tisk, tisk, McCurdy. Anyway, um, we're going to let Hurdy Birdie McCurdy rest while she's resting on leave. I'm going to see if I can negotiate my way across this floodplain towards that tree and hopefully there's a big cat underneath it. While I do that, we're going to send you all the way to South Africa and Noel will say hello. Everyone from Juma in South Africa in the Sabi Sands. It is warm, warm, warm. It's about 33 degrees Celsius, which is about, I think, 92 degrees Fahrenheit. I am Noel, and on camera I have Sebastian. Hi, Hello. Seb. Fantastic. So don't forget, we are live. We are interactive. Hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or follow us on the YouTube chat. So this morning I was chatting with Tristan. It seemed to be a little bit quiet, and I don't know if this heat is going to give us much but I'm always hopeful as you know so we're gonna head towards water holes because of how warm it is I'm gonna hope that we get something drinking or possibly playing in the water a little bit of activity um, and so hopefully some good birds some good birds so as I start making my way down towards uh, Juma Dam we'll see if we have anything sort of hiding in the shade I hope everybody's day or night or whatever time zone you're in is very good and it's pleasant and that you're enjoying being with us I have a feeling that uh, Brent and Jamie up in the Mara have been showing you lots of wonderful things. The Mara is always a, a good place for viewing, as is Juma itself. And also while we're busy heading towards our water holes, I'm going to be looking for tracks as well because that sometimes will help us see if anything's been coming or going. And then of course with the birds, we're still on the lookout for the nemesis bird, our little Colossus Cuckoo, as well as actually any of the cuckoos I haven't really been able to get any of the cuckoos on camera for you all it is summer uh, we get red red chested cuckoo we've been hearing uh, black cuckoo Jacobin's cuckoo I haven't heard the Lavellans yet I'm excited for that also been hearing some deer jicks cuckoo the African cuckoo I haven't heard quite yet it's a little bit early in the season still and we'll be on the lookout for all of those today. If there's anything special that everybody would like to try and look for, please let me know. Send those questions or comments through. I don't believe we had any homework from yesterday afternoon, but you can also remind me in case I have um, lost the plot slightly and forgotten anything I was supposed to look up for you all. We have people tracks. I actually want to show you something interesting. I think we'll have time for this. And while I'm busy setting up this special tracking exercise for you, let's head on over to Jamie who has an ostrich. Not something that we see often here in South Africa, but it sounds like the Mara has it in plentiful, plentiful numbers. True indeed that we see them far more often than we do in, well, than we do in South Africa. So, tra tracking exercise, that sounds like a great deal of fun. So while Noel figures out that whole process and puts it together for you, um, this afternoon we will be joined by a school in the next five or so minutes. 
and of course for our new viewers I always like to explain a little bit about it just so that you know exactly what it is that's going on so pretty much almost every weekday afternoon we're joined by a school or a couple of schools and during that time we take the questions only from the kids or the, or the teenagers joining us and that doesn't mean you stop sending through your questions please keep sending through your questions one thing that we found afterwards was that people thought that they were no longer welcome to send through questions and so they stopped after or during the school drive that we definitely don't want so please continue to send through your questions in the normal way hashtag safari live on twitter and this afternoon we'll be joined by hanover so lots of ostriches this is an entirely different group and I have to say, far less flirtatious on the part of the females. They're paying much less attention to the pink-necked male. Oh, where is everything? There's a th stillness. James, with, the, with regards to the, the pink coloration of the male ostriches, which is, of course... Um, brighter in when the birds are breeding which is also confusing me about this breeding season deal from what I've read but when it's they, your question is when do they start developing that my guess would be that it happens when they reach sexual maturity so at around about three or four years old they'll start being able to flush pink in that way that's my guess but I, I'm honestly not a hundred percent sure if that's accurate it just makes sense in my head that if they're ready and fully grown at that age, unless it's something that only starts to happen when they are dominant, that is also a possibility. Um, so, you know, then it would be six or seven years, but I, I would guess a three or four. Would you agree? Breeding age, it's, a, it's something that's more noticeable during breeding. So, yes, uh, that would be my guess. And of course, when they are small, when they are tiny chicks, they are completely different in color. Tiny little grass and dirt colored creatures to help to keep them camouflaged. Because you can imagine how an ostrich chick, chick would be a very tasty snack. An adult ostrich can fight back, and fight back they do. And I'm sure Noelle will, perhaps not during her tracking exercise, but possibly afterwards, if you ask her nicely, I'm sure she'll draw out an ostrich track for you and show you just where that massive claw sits on their biggest toe. I would do it here, but solid mud doesn't really make for a good drawing canvas. Much rather use the dust of Juma. It's a really stunning afternoon, but it has got very hot after that storm. It almost feels like that was just the appetizer, and the main course is on its way. Jilly, most of those decorated ostrich eggs that you see in shops, and I um, I had this bizarre image initially of a, of a female ostrich decorating her ostrich eggs. But you are, of course, talking about the hand-carved or the hand-painted ostrich eggs that you see in curio shops. Those will be sourced from ostrich farms. So ostriches are very, very commonly farmed. In fact, one of Brent's favorite facts is that the most ostriches in the world are found in Texas, of all places. Um, and that is because the meat is exceptionally healthy. It is lean, um, but, but, but yeah, it's lean. It's sort of a lean equivalent to steak or, or fatty red meat. Um, they're also used, the feathers are used in all sorts of ornamental things, um, scarves, although I couldn't imagine why, feather dusters, and the eggs are used for decoration. And just like with chickens it is possible for ostriches to lay unfertilized ostrich eggs so it doesn't mean that they've been whipped away from mum and that the the baby ostriches has, has been unduly expelled before it can hatch they are farmed okay so while I've been rattling on about ostriches the Juma team have been busy getting ready you've already met Noel let's head across to Rolf so that he can share his good afternoon greetings with you
Good afternoon everybody and welcome with me Ralph Kirsten here on the Sabi Sands in the Kruger National Park of South Africa. I am the other vehicle that's driving around and along with Noel and we've got Viam on the camera and so here we are sitting just in front of the Chitwa Dam and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just on my way down there. We're just going to go and see what we, what we can find. So please join me. Let's, let's, let's move down and see what, what is down there by the, by the water hole. I'm, I'm thinking there might be some hippos for us. And uh, yes, it does look like it. So it's uh it's a lovely 33 degrees centigrade and 94 degrees fahrenheit so quite a nice warm day for us obviously as we start out on these game dives on these hot summer days things are normally quite calm and uh, everything taking rest up in the shade but uh, let's move up here and we'll just see what we can see in the dam i'm sure the hippos are taking the cool in the water Definitely won't be out of the water on a day like this, nice and hot. And uh, we'll just stop up here and take a nice bit of a view. There we go, we've got some hippos there. It's uh, it's actually my first down, my first time down to this to this dam, so I'm discovering it with you guys. Looks like there's quite a few hippos out in front here. Now folks, with that, please join us on hashtag Safari Live on Twitter and uh, on YouTube. Please comment, please uh, throw us all your questions and we'll do our best to answer as best we can. We can hear some ox peckers, red billed ox peckers, and we've got some red billed buffalo weavers nests over there in that nice big a leadwood tree that it looks like it's dying off a little bit maybe maybe when the dam rose the, uh, it probably drowned so but now it's it's lovely nice nesting place for these red bull buffalo weavers red bull buffalo weavers are sort of communal nesters they are cooperative breeders there will be a whole family unit with all the youngsters and everybody assisting in the nesting and and raising of the young very haphazard way of making their nests but they are quite large they use stick material as opposed to a lot of the birds using grass but um, they're not they're not very they're quite messy they're not very uh, organized like a lot of your weavers that tie things up they just sort of throw things around but um, they've still got their organized little family units So it's quite nice and hot as I've said and there's not, not too much action going on. Everybody just taking that mid-afternoon sort of uh, quietness, getting ready for that late afternoon action. Those hippos going underwater, coming up every now and then. Looks like there's a couple of youngsters with them. Okay, so I'm still going to try and just discover things around here a little bit and we're going to see what these hippos are up to. I'm going to try and do a little bit of a count, but I think Noel's got something to tell you about tracking. Okay, everyone, I'm ready for my little tracking expedition with you. So Seb, I believe you're focusing in on this track. This is a track from this morning from the bushwalk that James did this one here so you, you see the imprint of the heel of the shoe and then the ball of the shoe okay now if you come over here you can see where it looks like something's dragged on the ground that's me and I did that on purpose because I need to now show you something so James is a is a boy he's a man so this is part just just go with me like James is a boy I'm a girl so now I'm gonna walk sorry you have to look at my backside I'm gonna walk as I would normally walk Okay, can we see my tracks? Okay, so now there's a couple things I want you all to notice. One is 
my track, okay? But in general, my tracks are very straight. James walks with a little bit of an outward step. Can we all see that? Can we see the angle of his foot there? Okay. So now I'm going to draw down the middle of these lines here. Okay, so with James's tracks, there's not much space to move around in. Okay, I can barely even do two lines. I'm pretty much stuck to one line. Now, me being a girl, watch what happens. Sorry, I can't draw straight lines. <laughs> there's about a half a centimeter, well, a centimeter, so maybe like half an inch, roughly in between the two. Okay, so now I'm a girl, I'm meant to have babies, my pelvic region is open more, James should not be able to get pregnant, his pelvic region would be in. You can see that just from the steps, okay, just from the inside of the steps, alright, I'm sorry my lines are not very straight. Then, here's my foot, okay, sorry, James's foot, we're going to start from here. So this is one print, this is one step. Right? From heel to toe. One foot, one foot. Second foot, sorry. Then, you're going to go up to the third step. That is the stride. Okay? Now, the stride of the person... Let's do James's as well. There's one step. And here's one stride. Okay? That should be the shoulder height of the person. So using my trusty tracking stick, about to here. So it's one, right? <laughs> this is harder to do by myself. And then two, so it's basically coming up to here. James is shorter than I am. Can we see the lines, the difference in between there? So there's my shoulder and there's James's shoulder. Okay. So now we've established that there's, I'm five foot nine. So I would guess that James is five, six, roughly. We've established sort of shoulder height of a person, and we've established there's one male and one female walking here, and they're walking in that direction. Does all of this sort of make sense? So by the width in between the steps, the, um, the amount of the width will tell you male or female, and then the shoulder height of the person. You can even go further, okay? Let's do, Seb, where's a good print for you? Can you do this print? Can you get that one? Okay, so now, and this depends on the size of your hand, and you have to build up a sort of encyclopedia for this. I'm just going to step on this side. So you can even tell the size of the shoe of the person. So it starts here, and it ends there. I'm going to guess that James wears about an 11. I'm a little out of practice for this. About an 11. We'll have to double check and see if it's true. And then my shoe size, this is a 9. Um, and you can just... Maybe James is a 10 and a half, but I'm going to go with 11. You can just barely see um, the sort of side, the similarity with James's foot being just slightly larger. So two hands and then a little bit smaller than that. So now we've got a size 9 and a size 11, male, female, walking that way. This is used in some cases to help establish a sequence, also using the pattern of the shoe, of how many people have come onto a property that are not supposed to be here. So this would be done in sort of anti-poaching work in some scenarios. So I just wanted to show you that little I was going to make it brief, but it's really not a brief explanation by, <laughs> by any stretch of the imagination. So I'm just going to plug in. Faith, I'm plugged back in. There we go. Sorry, let me just hop in quickly and then plug in. There we are. So that helps friends that I have do their work out, out in the field. So that's your little learning curve today for the tracking thing. If it didn't make sense, or if you want me to go over it a little bit, let me know. Sorry, Faith, where are we headed to? Uh, Brent has some cheeky cheeky lions for you up in the Masai Mara. I'm not quite sure how hot it is there today, but I'm sure that it's probably just as warm as we are here. And so let's head on up to him and see what he has to show us that side. Well, a 
big welcome to Hanover High School. And there we go, the Lions looking at you for your school drive today. So a big welcome to you guys. We are coming to you live from the Masai Mara in Kenya. My name is Brent Leo Smith. I have Jahawi on camera. And we are in such an incredible position that we can bring you wildlife from Kenya and from South Africa all at the same time, 100% live. Now, I am with actually three male lions, although only two of them are here, and he's giving us a good look. Hello, big boy. Now, they form part of a male lion coalition. There are six of them in total. Only three are here. The others could be lying in a little depression close by. It is about 28, 29 degrees Celsius here, so quite warm. And you can see lots of little biting flies all over his face. Hey, mister. It's okay. And his partner in crime is flat, flat out. Now, the lions don't really move around too much at this time of the day. Now, being a predator, they will take any opportunity if something wanders too close to them. But if their core body temperature raises by just a few degrees, it can put them in a life-threatening situation. So they're going to wait till it cools down, probably only get moving around 7 or 8 o'clock tonight. It's just after 5 o'clock in the afternoon here at the moment. Now, guys, I'd love to hear questions from you. And, oh, he's being very nice. Normally at this time of the day, the lions you find are completely flat. But he's, he's giving us a little bit of a, well, actually a really great view of him at the moment. So as I said, he's part of a six male lion coalition called the Bila Shaka Boys. Now the Bila Shaka is a small little river system that runs it through here. And uh, they've recently moved into this area in the last five, five or so months. And uh, they are, have still not managed to get too many prides of their own. They are quite young. Um, the youngest, these guys being, are three of the younger ones. And they are about, about three, two and a half to three years old. The older, older ones are just over three years old and are already starting to mate with a single lioness that's in this area. TS would like to know, is the lion population in, Ken, uh, in Africa sorry, staying steady or declining? On an average it, average, it has declined extensively over the last 50 years or so. Um, estimated probably 20,000 lions left in the wild in Africa. And in the 50s, there were probably 120,000. Oh, he's up. And he's going to go join the other one who's lying to the right of us. Now, the other lion has found himself a little bit of a damp spot. There's been some rain, so that's why he's out in the sun there. Now, the coalition bonds, or the bonds between coalition members are very, very strong. And a big coalition like this of six male lions is probably going to rule for quite a long time and be able to sire many generations of new cubs. Um, as I was saying about the lion population in general, um, it is on the decline through a lot of areas. It remains stable in certain parts of Africa, like the Masai Mara and the Serengeti and uh, the Greater Kruger, where you'll go visit shortly, uh, as well as... Botswana, Zambia, and uh, certain parts of Mozambique, Namibia, have all got stable lion populations. But as a whole, throughout Africa, the populations have declined drastically over the last 50 years. Now, as that lines are not going to get up to too much at this time of the day, they're going to be snoozing. So what we're going to do is we're going to move on. And we've got a whole host of other animals close to us at the moment. There's big herds of zebra and wildebeest that I'm sure are going to be very worried about the lions later on this evening. Now, this is my favorite coalition of males, and I'm very excited to see how they develop over the next couple of months, whether they put big pressure on the two other adult male coalitions, one across the river and one just to the south uh, of us here. But as I said, there are lots of other animals out here. So let's go say hello to Jamie, who's got the fastest antelope in Africa.
the fastest antelope in Africa indeed. And just because we've got the school joining us this afternoon, let me quickly reintroduce myself and then we can chat, get the boring stuff out of the way first, and then we can talk a little bit more about the antelope that we can that we're looking at. My name is Jamie and this afternoon Manu is on camera with me and as Brent told you we're sitting with the fastest antelope in Africa. It's known as a topi. Topi. It's one, uh, I think it's probably one of the best names for an antelope that we get out here. And you can really see how physically the topi is structured for speed and stamina as well. Uh, the way that they are built, powerfully constructed with very, very large shoulders and sloping backs, creates a very energy efficient stride as they run. So not only are they exceptionally fast, they are also, they can sustain it for a long time. So they can run for long periods of time over long distances at that speed. Whereas if you're looking at something like a lion or a leopard or even especially a cheetah, they're exceptionally fast over short bursts of speed but none of them really have the stamina to sustain it. When you're looking at predators you, when, and you talk of stamina, you're thinking really more about the wild dogs and hyenas rather than the big cats. What's also quite interesting while we look at the topi, and by the way, I'm sure you're going to want to ask me why they have those black spodges on their legs. I actually don't know. I mean, a topi is essentially an East African version of a tsesebi, which is the Southern African equivalent. But the Southern African equivalent doesn't have those black patches on their legs. And I'm not quite sure exactly what those are for. Ah, Ilana, who is 14 years old and very, very astute. Ilana wants to know why is it that different species of dogs can interbreed but different antelope species can't. Technically, dog breeds are not a different species. So the definition of a species, and it gets a little complicated here, but bear with me. Among other things, one of the definitions of a species is that they cannot or, or two different species is that they cannot interbreed with each other and produce a viable offspring. In other words, an offspring that can then go on to reproduce. So a horse and a donkey, and now I'll confuse myself, yes, a horse and a donkey can breed, but a mule is sterile. It can't breed. Right, with that basic definition in mind, dogs are the same species, they're different breeds. Antelope are different species entirely and sometimes even different, in, in fact in a lot of cases, not even just a different species but belonging to a different genus. Now the way that we classify animals is in terms of their differences and the big differences group them into kingdom and then order and then phylum and so on and so forth. Kingdom, phylum, order, family, genus species. Okay, so you sort of group them down in that order, but if, it, if they're two different genuses, then they're completely different. Now, here's where it gets a little bit confusing. There are certain antelope species that do breed with each other. For example, a sesebi and a hartebeest can breed, so the southern African equivalent of a, of a topi. Now, if we're talking about that, now if you look at the topi, and the Thompson's gazelle that's on the left of it, you get a really good idea of just how different those two species are. So they really, really are completely separate from each other. Now you get a Thompson's gazelle and a Grant's gazelle out here. Now they're a bit more similar and they look quite similar. Even their horns look similar. And you get a Tsesebi and a Coke's hartebeest that look similar and are very closely related and possibly even in situations where they don't have any other option could probably interbreed. So it's, it, it is essentially because dog breeds are breeds and not different species. Okay, well, speaking of entirely different 
families and different tribes of antelope from the members of the Hartebeest tribe here in the Maasai Mara. Let's go all across to join Noel and her spiral horned antelope. All right, from one antelope species in the Mara who uses very distinctive skills in those open spaces, namely their speed, to an antelope species here in South Africa who uses its cryptic coloration, its disruptive body structure inside of those um, uh, stripes there on the side. This is the kudu. So instead of speeding away to get away from predators, it blends in. So it blends in with those stripes like I mentioned, blends in with the little uh, dots and stripes that are on the face, it blends in with the ears, it blends in with the coloration on the legs, up through into the fact that when it runs off as well, it will lift its tail to have a bit of white for something to focus on and then drop it when it comes around the corner. Everything about this particular species of antelope is meant to elude predation. doesn't mean that they can't um, elude forever, uh, but, but it does help. The only species I will say that it, none of this works for is wild dogs. Dog, African wild dogs, African painted wolves are extremely adept at chasing kudu through the bushes. And then I have to apologize and say, excuse me, how rude am I? Welcome Hanover High School. I hope you're really enjoying uh, the afternoon drive with us. I am Noelle and I've got Sebastian on camera with me. So sorry about that, everybody. Don't forget you can send questions through. We love, love, love your questions. Uh, hashtag Safari Live or on the YouTube chat. I'm not quite sure which platform you're on, but we do really enjoy them. All right, enough with my face. Let's go back to the kudu's face, because that's what we're here about, is the wildlife of Africa and experiencing what we get to very nicely see every day. And hopefully one day you all will be able to travel overseas to us and come and experience this in person. So another thing you'll notice about this kudu as she slowly moves around is that she is a browser. She eats leaves. So she's not attempting to bend her head down in an awkward position. She's utilizing where her neck is placed in the shoulder and her head to deftly, with her tiny little lips, pick off those small little leaves. And you just see how carefully she, she chooses each and every one. I believe your question is why does the kudu keep nodding at your head their heads um so when she's eating like this she keeps moving her head around the branches so as not to get any branches near her eyes and then pulling it around to select her leaves a little by little. But with some of the other antelope species, you'll see them constantly nodding their heads. Something like a wildebeest, the topi might be doing it up there in the Mara, and that has a lot to do with flies that are in their nose. Um, I know specifically with a wildebeest, which hopefully we'll be able to see, and if I can't show you, um, hopefully Jamie or Brent can, um, they get these things called a little nasal bot fly that flies up, and so they're constantly snorting them out and, sh and moving their heads up and down. But for her, uh, for this particular particular antelope species, it's just for her to reposition uh, where she wants to eat from. Now we've got the rest of her herd of kudus over here. So we decided the other day amongst the viewers that this will now be known as a cutlery of kudu in the, the uh, collective noun. So we were talking the other day about how most mammal species have a collective noun. So, ooh, I actually don't know what a topi collective noun is. Jamie might know or Brent might know. Uh, for instance, impala is a, a rank of impala. and uh, Elephants is a parade of elephants. Um, and then the kudu didn't have one, so we made one up. It's now a cutlery of kudu. And then we just very briefly had another antelope species walking just behind the kudu there. Fantastic, Seb, you're brilliant. Beautiful male water buck. Holden, you're curious to know how long do the kudu live for? It's a very good question. A kudu the si or a kudu, an antelope the size of that kudu will live roughly about 12 years. Um, anything sort of smaller than a kudu, you're going to start decreasing in, in longevity. But a kudu is about 12 years, and I would guesstimate that water buck that, that uh, briefly showed itself as it walked past would also be about 10 years. Uh, maybe not pushing up to 12, but possibly right around in there. 
great questions. Then just in front of us, we have our third antelope species within 100 meters, so about 100 yards, about the size of your uh, soccer fields back home. Straight up ahead, we've got our rank of kudu that is slowly coming out of the bushes. So something that's interesting to note here is we have waterbuck, we have kudu, we have impala, all within the same area. Um, they like to group together when possible. The more eyes, the more ears, the more sense of smell, better chance of survival. But then also what you're seeing here is the impala have already come down to drink at the water hole that's behind us. Then the kudu have already come down to drink. The water buck are now making their way there. So sometimes you'll see them all drinking together, but a lot what you'll see is they'll sort of filter through so, so as to give each other time. Now notice the different colorations on this impala, much more vivid than the very gray um, kudus we saw, as well as those gray water buck. These colors pop out just a little bit more. And with these particular animals, they live in open spaces as well as closed spaces. So when they're in more open spaces, they group together, um, banding together, so that it's harder for a predator just to pick one. Um, and then they tend to do behavior that mimics each other also to, to help with that predation. Now, they're not doing any sort of behavior other than eating right now and walking away and showing us their bums. Uh, they're very relaxed. They can't smell or hear or see anything that would make them nervous. So this would be your normal relaxed impala behavior. All right, well, my friend Rolf is on the other side of Juma, and he is at Chitwa Chitwa Dam, and he would like to show you something from his end, so let's head on over to him.